Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. About a year ago, those of you who follow Patreon might remember that I picked up this issue 1.5 and said I was looking forward to reverse engineering the cockroach mod. Well, I finally found some time to get round to it. As you can see, there's a fairly hefty modification going on here above the Z80 CPU. The ULA on this is an issue 1, and that's extremely relevant for this mod. An issue 2 board with an issue 1 ULA in is what we call an issue 1.5. That's not an official name given by Sinclair, it's just a colloquial name that we give it within the community. So you can see there are two pins bent up from the ULA, detached from the PCB and connected instead to this modification board which is stuck on to the top of the Z80. Various other wires are coming off this, one connected to a Z80 pin, the rest seem to be going into wires on the PCB itself. There's a single chip on the board which we'll look at in more detail. We don't know if those wires are connected directly to the wires or if they go through and connect to something else, so let's get the board out of the case and have a look on the underside. No, nothing going on under here, so we can take all our measurements from the top side of the board. I've stuck the modification board down with some blue tack so it's easier to probe around and we can get a good look at the chip. Throughout the video I'm going to be referring to the Spectrum Hardware Manual. This was released in 1983, written by Adrian Dickens and even with the internet at hand this is really useful and concise. Here we can see that the two bent up pins on the ULA correspond to A14 and A15, that's pins 36 and 37. So at this point let's start beeping everything out with a multimeter and figuring out what's hooked up to what. The chip on there is a SN74LS00N, that's a simple quad NAND gate and we'll take a look at that in more detail soon. Once I've written down all the connections that have been made as part of this modification, I'll be able to make a drawing and a schematic which will help the process of understanding why the mod's been made. Ok, here's our 74LS00 chip. I lifted this from a datasheet, you can see it's 4 NAND gates. All of our inputs come from the Z80, those are A14 and A15, and IORQGE. A14 and A15 form part of the address bus, and the IORQGE signal tells us that the Z80 has placed a valid address on the address bus for an I.O. request. Of course the chip also needs plus 5 volts and a ground connection. And before we get on to the outputs, let's take another look at this board from the underside. Uh, you can see that a lot of the pins on the chip are actually linked together. Clearly this is an important step in understanding how it works, so let's mark those on our drawing as well. I found that A14 was actually linked to both inputs on the first NAND gate of the 4. The output of which goes straight into the input on the top right NAND gate. The IORQ signal is also linked directly to an input of this NAND gate, as well as the bottom left NAND gate. And the output of this NAND gate is linked directly to an input of the bottom right NAND gate, and also linked to the other input of this NAND gate. Ok, it's taking shape. Let's bring the ULA in and mark on the outputs of our mod. Those are A14 and A15 from pins 8 and 11. So clearly we are trying to manipulate A14 and A15 based on the IORQ signal. To understand why we need to do that, we're going to need to go a bit deeper and we also need to know that this mod is only necessary for an issue 1 ULA and we'll find out why. To understand why this mod's necessary, we need to learn a little bit about memory contention. So we need to return to the most powerful of tools, Microsoft Paint. Turn your attention to this beautiful diagram of our machine. We've got an issue on ULA, Z80, lower RAM and a display showing Treasure Island Dizzy. Let's add some signals to the diagram which will help us with our understanding of memory contention. Fact number one, the Z80's clock is generated and provided by the ULA chip. Next up our address bus, the ULA and the Z80 both have the ability to address the lower RAM. The ULA might want to read from the lower RAM, the Z80 might want to write to or read from the lower RAM. The address bus is shared, but the Z80 side of the address bus is separated by a bank of resistors, which means the ULA does have priority over the Z80 if they're both addressing at the same time. The lower RAM actually contains the video memory. 
This is a bank of memory which contains all of the information necessary to generate the display that you can see in the top left of the screen. One of the ULA's many jobs is to periodically read the contents of the video memory and spit it out onto the display, crudely speaking. This is all well and good, but the Z80 is also trying to do its job, and that involves writing to and reading from the lower memory. So, when both of these chips are trying to access the video memory at the same time, we have what's called memory contention. And who should get priority in this case? Well, the designers decided the ULA should have priority so that the display can continue being generated. To this end, some logic was included in the ULA, called a memory contention handler. The job of which is to monitor the Z80's activity and identify when a clash or a conflict was about to occur. And when this happens, which is a lot, the memory contention handler influences the clock signal generated by the ULA and forces it to pause. This essentially freezes time for the Z80, so the Z80 doesn't really know anything's happened. Once the ULA has finished its video operation, it restarts the clock signal and the Z80 continues none the wiser. That's all well and good, but we also know that the address bus can be used to address input-output devices, such as the keyboard, and for this reason we also need an input-output contention handler, as the ULA might be fetching video data from the memory the Z80 might want to change the contents of the address bus for an I.O. operation. The ULA knows that the Z80 is doing this based on the I.O. REQ signal, and this is fed into the I.O. contention handler logic within the ULA. However, there is a bug in the issue 1 ULA's logic, which means that the I.O. contention handler doesn't work correctly. This means it's possible for the Z80 to be unsatisfied in its I.O. request because the ULA was busy fetching video data from lower memory. So what are Sinclair to do? They've already made all these ULA chips and they don't really want to throw them away, so they need to get clever and design a modification which fixes the issue and effectively switches off the I.O. contention handler. Let's take a break from Microsoft Paint and take a look at memory contention in action. You might want to pause the video here if you want to copy this code. What this is going to do, it's going to force the snow effect, which you might have heard of. Here we can see little black blips appearing all over the screen and the text has become garbled. Without going into too much detail, what the code's doing here is exploiting a bug in the ULA, which essentially shows us what happens without a memory contention handler. The ULA's attempts to drag the video data out of memory and put them onto the screen are being messed up by the Z80 interfering with the address bus. The snow effect is actually due to the dynamic RAM refresh operations from the Z80. The snow effect is due to the row address strobe timing when addressing the lower RAM. So, this isn't a perfect representation of this memory contention issue that the ULA prevents, but it serves a purpose to show what kind of problems you would have without it. Okay, back to work, and let's talk memory maps. The first 16 kilobytes of addressable memory in our spectrum are actually occupied by our ROM chip. In decimal, that's address location 0 to 16383. In binary, that means that A15 and A14 are both 0, and A13 through 0 can be occupied with 1s and zeros as you like. The next 16 kilobytes of memory are our lower RAM. Any address within this range constitutes an access request to the lower memory chips and could be a memory contention issue. What's important to know here is that A14 rolls over to 1, and A13 to 0 roll back over to all zeros and start counting up until they're all 1s. So if A15 is 0 and A14 is 1, we know that the lower memory is being accessed. Any addresses above this would have A15 set to 1. The significance of this is that the ULA knows when A15 is 0 and A14 is 1, it should be looking for memory contention events. These two signals feed into the memory contention handler to tell it when to be active. With this in mind, and remembering that we have an issue with our I.O. contention handler, let's look at our modification again. I've turned this drawing into a schematic. Using this and a truth table for a NAND gate, 
we can come up with a description of how this modification works for the various combinations of inputs. Let's start with the obvious one. If I or RQ is low, which means active, we have a zero on the first input of the NAND gate in the bottom left. Looking at the truth table, any input being a zero means the output goes to one. This puts a one on both inputs of the NAND gate in the bottom right, forcing the output to be zero, which feeds a zero value in for A15 to the ULA. At the same time, we get a zero in the top right gate, which forces A14 to be one. What this means is when the Z80 is making an I.O. request, the ULA receives A14-1 and A15-0, which, as we know, means the ULA believes the Z80 is addressing lower memory. And how about the other case? Let's set IORQ to 1, and let's see what happens to A15. If A15 from the Z80 is 0, well then the output of the bottom left NAND gate goes to 1, which means, as we've seen, the output of the bottom right gate goes to 0, and A15 is passed through unmodified. Similarly, if A15 is 1, then the output of the bottom left gate goes to 0, which means the output of the bottom right gate goes to 1, and A15 once again is not modified. We can do the same thing looking at A14, with IORQ set to 1. If A14 is 0, we get a 1 out of the first gate and a 0 out of the second gate, A14 is passed through. A14 is 1, then we get a 1 passed through. So both of the address lines are modified if IORQ is set to 1. I think we've just about figured this out. So, in order to disable the IO contention handler, which is faulty in the issue 1 ULA, we actually fool the ULA into thinking that the Z80 is accessing contended lower memory when it's actually making an IO request. This way, the IO contention is handled by the memory contention handler which pretty much works as intended. Now, being me, and apologies to the collectors out there, but I'm going to take this mod off so we can see how the machine behaves without it. Don't worry, I'm going to put it back on when I'm finished. One benefit of filming everything you do is that you always have pictures to look back on when you need to put something back that you've taken off. I am going to be super delicate with this ULA, it's the only issue one ULA that I've got, and it is actually working, as we'll see. So I've bent the pins back in, I'm going to pop it back in the socket, I've also removed the dead cockroach completely, and here we have an issue 2 with an issue 1 ULA and no modification. I've bunged it into this Spectrum Plus case and put a dandinator in the back which contains a diagnostic ROM. I'm having to use a Kempston joystick to navigate the menus because the keyboard just doesn't work without this modification applied. Using Brendan's diagnostic ROM, we can do a ULA test, port addressing, and the border should be flashing green and white. As you can see, we're getting some black in there as well, so we'd fail this test. And that's not a very dramatic demonstration of the sort of failure mode you get without the mod, so let's look again at the keyboard test this time. And all hell breaks loose. So, our faulty I.O. contention handler is really failing miserably here. It should be telling the Z80 to wait while it finishes its video operations, but it's basically not, and this is the result. Let's put it back together and try again. Don't look too closely at this shot because I hooked it up wrong, but I did correct it and didn't do any damage in the process. This is fiddly work. I do not envy the person in the factory who had to apply this mod to presumably hundreds of machines. Okay, again with the diagnostic ROM, this time I could navigate the menus with the keyboard, and as you can see, we've got a nicely functioning keyboard. So, the I.O. contention handler has been disabled, which was causing all that noise on the previous test, and instead, the memory contention handler is handling all of the contention checking. Also, we can see the ULA port addressing test is working, flashing white and green border, no black borders to be seen. Alright, and that's that. I should mention that the 5C112, which is the next revision of the ULA, does fix this issue. That cockroach mod is basically incorporated into the ULA's logic internally. And I have to recommend the ZX Spectrum ULA book by Chris Smith. This was invaluable in figuring out this modification, and if you're a boffin like me, it's an essential read. 
Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.